allowing that the UN human rights standards are not mutually exclusive. We're now live. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Fergal Black. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to welcome you to this breakout session, uh, the title of which is Probation and Reintegration into the Community After Prison. Just to introduce myself, uh, I'm the Director of Care and Rehabilitation within the Irish Prison Service, which essentially means that uh, I am responsible for all non-security services that are delivered to prison to prisoners. Uh, this afternoon, uh, this session will hear about uh, responses to disability and interventions from the probation service. Uh, it will consider the overwhelming challenge uh, that is presented in re relation to mental health among prisoners. And uh, we'll also hear about measures to improve the transition from custody to community for, um, for prisoners. So I'll be joined by Michael Murchin, Assistant Principal in the Mental Health Unit Department of Health, Barry Owens, the Programme Manager, Irish Association for the Social Inclusion Opportunities, and David Williamson, a Senior Probation Officer, Staff and Training Development in the Probation Service. As well, just by way of kind of introduction, uh, I've been thinking a little bit about the conference and kind of struck by the team uh, which talks about effective access to justice for persons with disabilities uh, and responsive interventions through healthcare, education, rehabilitation, employment, and kind of transition to community. Uh, and I suppose just to give you a, a little kind of flavor, of, obviously from myself, and I know you've already had a session on prisons, but like I, I would like to think the prisons have come, a have come some way in being more outward looking in the last decade. Um, I suppose we do the view, we take the view that you know courts do the punishment they deny the liberty and almost all prisoners return to the community uh, and ultimately our objective is to make community safer and ultimately have less victims so we believe that by improving the prison system we can help prisoners change their lives better protect those prisoners uh, and those who work in prison hopefully help to break the cycle of reoffending and ultimately save the taxpayer money um, and I know there's a popular myth in some quarters that prison should be about maybe breaking people down. But my view and that of the IPS is that we endeavour to empower people and build them up. But throughout each sentence, we look to take steps uh, that should be taken to give prisoners the best opportunities to reintegrate themselves back into society by imparting some life skills and try to put them back in the road of being a good citizens again. Uh, prisoners need to be physically and mentally healthy be provided with opportunities to engage in and develop through education, work training, psychology, and many other services that are op offered while in prison. I suppose my observation is that prisons are full of poor people. But that's not just poor economically. It's also poor emotionally, educationally, socially, and in the context of their, context of their health status. Many young men in prison uh, have difficulty regulating their emotions, Typically, they are young men in the age range of about 18 to 35 who have fallen out of education, training, and essentially are falling out, fallen out of society into prison. We, as a, an organization in the prison service, and working with our partners in probation and others, uh, and ASIO and many others, we need to get through to these people, and we need them to understand that their actions have hurt other people and trampled on their rights. Uh, some would argue this is a soft approach, I suppose I take an alternative view. We need to challenge 
what are essentially mainly young men to take responsibility and start owning some of their behavior. And a harsh approach doesn't do this. And really important within this is the relationship that we build up between our staff and prisoners. Uh, that requires that prisoners are treated with dignity and respect. Uh, that helps to build a relationship. And the relationship is essentially an instrument that can take offenders into a space where they begin to own some of their behaviors. You know? So that's the kind of trajectory that the prison service is on. And just in terms of the areas we'll cover, uh, I suppose it would be remiss of me if I didn't say, and I know I had a colleague, Dr. Margaret McGovern, on an earlier breakout session, speak about the provision of appropriate mental health services to persons in custody is probably the single biggest challenge to effective healthcare in prisons at the moment. Um, and people who present with mental health the illness uh, have alongside other vulnerabilities and We've seen a significant increase in the number of persons committed to prison presenting with severe and enduring mental illness. And we're not a therapeutic environment, we're a custodial environment. And people present with many other aligned uh, mental health and other difficulties. Uh, and these are significantly related to our understanding of offending and behavioural problems in prisons. Supporting persons committed to custody with intellectual disability, ADHD, personality disorder, I'd have to say is not fully developed at prison level. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that 60-70% of the prison population suffer from a personality disorder. We have some research indicating that 28% of prisoners have an IQ below 70. And I suppose a lot of ADHD is significantly undiagnosed in prisons. So my colleague spoke earlier about people with four or more ACEs are 20 times more likely to end up in custody. So I, what I hope my colleagues will pick up on is, you know, there's a there's a wide variety um, in terms of what we try to do with people in custody. But one of the things we've tried to this outward looking is take all reasonable steps to facilitate the transition, the safe transition of an offender from custody to community. And that's a very significant challenge for people with mental health issues, people with personality disorders uh, and people with many, a whole range of disabilities. Um, so that's really just my intro. I'm going to call on Michael Murchin, uh, Assistant Principal Officer, Mental Health Unit, Department of Health, to talk to us now, and he's going to talk to you about mental health policy and supports for former prisoners. Thank you. Thank you, Fergal. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I would just like to say I would uh, concur with everything Fergal has said there, and uh, um, we are working together uh, between the Department of Health, the Department of Justice, the HSE, and and the Irish Prison and Probation Services to address all of the, um, build on the good work that's been done to date and address the difficulties that Fer Fergal highlighted there. The approach I'm taking to um, my presentation this afternoon is basically to give you a good overview of lots of issues um, that concern us in the department. I will highlight some uh, key messages from this and I will pick up on any points otherwise in the questions afterwards. So broadly speaking, from a mental health point of view and the Department of Health, um, the main relevant documents and policies uh, that concerns us is the Mental Health Act 2001 that we're updating at the moment, um, the new program for government, our shared future, and the mental health components in that, our new policy sharing the vision, our suicide prevention policy connecting for life. And all of these reflect the wider principles and objectives of the widely agreed Slauncher Care policy. One or two points I'd like to um, highlight today relates to the Mental Health Act governs the care, treatment, patient rights, and regulation and inspection of mental health services. One particular point relevant, I think, to the discussion today is that um, granting people greater autonomy and self-determination may have unintended consequences of certain people ending up in the prison system rather than seeking or accept, accepting treatment. It must be accepted that an individual with capacity has to, a right to articulate their own interests, even if that's a refusal of treatment or an admission to a psychiatric unit. Ultimately, those with mental illnesses 
or mental health issues who have capacity have the right to make what others may consider to be unwise decisions. This is a difficulty for us all in trying to um, improve uh, reintegration back into, this, into the uh, community. Um, two points in relation to the new programme for government is that it will establish a new task force looking at mental health, addiction and primary care um, issues and improvements for ex-prisoners. And it is also looking at uh, improving the acute and forensic mental health bed capacity nationally. Sharing the vision has uh, a number of recommendations specific to the uh, theme we're discussing today, including improving advocacy and peer supports, better transition to community care and community-based living. It refers also to court diversion, rebuilding Ireland housing strategy, including for prisoners, a more complete mental health needs assessment for prisoners, and the need to develop new regional intensive care rehabilitation units for mental health uh, following the opening of the new central mental hospital in Port Rand. Connecting for life potentially may apply to uh, ex-prisoners too, or some of them, and this coordinates and focused efforts of a range of government departments and state agencies. Um, to try and reduce the incidence of suicide. Next slide, please. Um, just a few points worth highlighting today on this is that there is just over a billion euro invested in mental health, which is significant by any standards. There are 65 approved centres and around 2,700 beds in the system. There are 115 community adult teams nationally. Um, there were around 35,000 new appointments offered uh, in, by the adult mental health teams in 2019. And in addition to the acute units and community mental health teams, there's a range of services such as congregated settings, day hospitals, and specialist in intervention teams around, for example, psychosis and self-harm, which may apply particularly to ex-prisoners. One or two other points worth noting is that around 25% of new appointments are seen within one week by the HSE Mental Health Services. Um, but around one in five new patients did not attend their first appointments in 2019. And this rate is probably higher for ex-prisoners due to various reasons. Next slide, please. Our legislation and the various policies I have indicated highlight some key principles. Core among these relevant to today's, today's discussion is equity, access and person-centred recovery. Our aim of the mental health services is to try and provide appropriate care in the appropriate setting at the appropriate time. There has been a big swing away from the old psychiatric institutions where people were locked up for long periods of time to more person-centered community care that provide more options. There's no doubt that we have a quality and safe mental health service, but access is an issue. But access is also an issue across the wider mental health service, or what the wider mental health service, particularly for younger people and across the health service in general. So we'll have to all work together to uh, improve that. And access is basically through GPs, uh, emergency departments, health centres, or for ex-prisoners um, via the uh, probation service, via uh, agreed aftercare plans. Next slide, please. There has been a number of good, positive, and new developments over the last four, five, or six years in mental health. While there was little investment in other areas of the health service. Mental health got 300 million since 2012. This has enabled us to upgrade all aspects of our mental health service. In particular, the HSE Mental Health Service strives to deliver high quality healthcare in a prison setting, to facilitate recovery, to reduce reoffending by, by developing and maintaining links with community mental health services and other health services. It, the HSE Mental Health Service is available to courts to consider the use of non-custodial options, 
uh, for defendants with mental illnesses charged with less serious offences. It also assists courts who, who may have a difficulty in accessing psychiatric services, and it assists courts in arrangement, arranging treatment with other health services, such as primary care and disability settings or addiction services. And it also um, provides updated in information to courts um, regarding the health and care needs of individuals. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight also is the potential use of new technology and digital technologies in um, complementing new approaches to care provision. This will not be a substitute for face-to-face -face, uh, services, but it will uh, allow professionals to link up better. It can reduce travel. It can improve out-of-hours care for ex-prisoners. And pilot projects in Ireland and elsewhere in other countries have proven this model of care. And the HSE intend to develop this, um, particularly with relation to uh, improving aftercare services for uh, prisoners. Next slide, please. There's a few other things I would like to mention today, uh, particularly in relation to improving services for ex-prisoners. And this relates to developing our primary care services, early intervention services, talk therapies, and DBT, um, dialectal behavior therapy. One improvement that has taken place in the last year or so is that the HSE have recruited around 130 psychologists for primary care. And these are helping uh, ex-prisoners to access services and reduce pressures on the specialist mental health services. We are also trying to progress the various recommendations of an interdepartmental group from 1916 under, on 2016 on diversion, particularly um, by building the new central mental hospital uh, in Dundrum and enhancing our community care teams specifically aimed uh, at ex-prisoners. Uh, um, the HSE liaises closely with the Irish Prison Service and the Probation Service in advance of prisoner releases to ensure uh, the best possible care plan and continuity of care once they are released. Next slide, please. The main points I would like to highlight here is that there are increasing demands on the mental health services, increasing ca case complexities and waiting lists are a problem. Um, mental health intellectual disability is an emerging area that the mental health services wish to work closer with the uh, probation service and Irish prison service on, on ex-prisoners as there is scope for improving um, services and links here. Challenging behaviour rather than mental health illnesses per se is also an issue for all of us to address. Staffing, recruitment and retention in the health services is a problem. And one way we have uh, addressed this is by increasing the number of nurse graduate training places that will be coming out from the, coming on stream from this year onwards. In, in, in effect, we're doubling the numbers coming on stream. We also hope, as I indicate here, to improve our seven day seven service nationally, improve out of hours service nationally. But one problem from the mental health services point of view is ex-prisoners having stable accommodation because it's very difficult to uh, maintain service engagement with them if they keep moving the dress. Next slide, please. Some of the next steps I just wish to highlight here over the immediate future is to agree the new service plan for the HSE for mental health for next year, uh, for 2021 including new, new service priorities for mental health, addiction and primary care services. We wish to open the new forensic or the new forensic uh, central mental hospital in uh, Port Ran to replace the old hospital in Dundrum and we hope to do that early next year. We also wish to progress new mental health units, forensic units at regional level. Minister Butler is establishing an implementation committee next month to monitor the implementation of the new sharing division strategy. Um, as I indicated, the new task force between health, justice, um, 
hopes to uh, commence work as quickly as possible. Um, so I believe the scope to improve and the team of the conference around access and continuity of care. It's not always a question of more money. We need to work together, work smarter and build on recent progress to achieve real improvement across the health and uh, judicial systems for reintegration for ex-prisoners. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, and if I can move on now to uh, Barry Owens, who I advised is Barry is the program manager with IASIO, the Irish Association for Social Inclusion Opportunities. And Barry's organisation work extensively with both the Irish Prison Service and the Probation Service. And Barry's organisation is centrally involved in that kind of transition piece of preparing people for transition from, from a prison perspective, from custody to community, and then working with people uh, in the community as part of the interventions that they have in place with the probation service. So Barry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fergal. And uh, hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. And it's very nice to uh, be part of the conference. It's been a very interesting day so far. Uh, I would like to talk about some of the practical supports, the way we um, respond to people individually in the prison and help them prepare for release and res resettlement. And to do that, I want to introduce you to what we do in the data and resettlement services in IASIO. So uh, my emphasis here is going to be on the practical supports, what happens in the prison. So can we go to the next slide and I can uh, begin to talk about that. Um, so first off, to get before I get to what we practically do for people, I might say a little bit about us. Um, we're funded by the prison service and the uh, probation service, but we're going to talk about just the prison side of things today. We have two main services in the prison operating uh, throughout most of the estate. Uh, not fully, but throughout most of the estate. The first one is the gate service. And that is, we, uh, we describe it as a guidance and placement service. It uh, relates to future direction and placement. So if not crime, then what? If somebody is not involved in committing a crime and wants to stay away from it, well, how do they go about that? It starts off uh, in a most fundamental way with opening up just the space to imagine an alternative. Now that's a very individual process. Somebody will be in a prison setting and maybe for the first time ever will be asked, what do you want? What stands in your way? And how are we going to support you? So that's what guidance does. The placement part of that folded there on the slide is um, individual direct support to help them achieve what they identify in the pathway. So very practical and we're trying to direct people away from the criminal justice system. That's what the gate service does. The resettlement service, our second uh, and probably the largest of our prison services at the moment is the resettlement service. We describe it as a primary needs service that enhances stability and release. That is, it starts with resettlement planning. If somebody's getting out, maybe for the first time, or maybe they have a history of imprisonment, the question is, how can we help that person understand that release pattern? And how can we best achieve what they want, stability and not to come back to prison? So resettlement planning is a primary part. It's the first step in the process, but it includes basic applications uh, around housing, accommodation support, medical card applications, and welfare supports. So very practical supports and essential um, uh, supports on release from prison. Okay, uh, next slide, please. In terms of uh, our size, our capacity, and the operation, uh, how it works, uh, the gate service is eight posts, four full-time, four part-time. So substantial, but uh, certainly it doesn't spread across the prison uh, estate. The resettlement service is 13 posts, 10 full-time, part and three part-time, um, and is in all closed prisons. So uh, there is, and access is done differently. In terms of access to the gate, it's by referral. Uh, anybody can be referred to the gate service. Uh, if people, uh, they can self-refer, so if the, uh, the ambition here is to be open uh, to whoever wants the service. The access to resettlement is somewhat different. It's general provision. Now that's not a referral based thing. So if somebody, uh, all people re being released from uh, prison should have access to a welfare appointment or payment, should have access to housing supports and should have access to medical card provision. And we make sure of that. So all sentenced prisoners have access to these things. And since COVID, we've introduced another part uh, of the service, which is a phone service. 
and that, and that is trying to reach more difficult. Uh, traditionally, we haven't worked with people on the land, so it's trying to provide a service to them and perhaps to people who are uh, isolated because of COVID or because of other reasons. So it's just trying to broaden out. But access is somewhat different, just to keep that in mind. Uh, referral through PIMS. Uh, PIMS is the information system uh, in, this, in, the, in the prison or general provision. Okay, can we take the next slide, please? In terms of the type of activity we're involved with, so it's busy. Uh, you know, the demand for the service and the prisoners themselves, uh, these are popular services. They want access to these services. So the gate referrals and placements since 2007. Uh, each service, by the way, starts off small and then it builds. So year on year, it's not the same amount of people providing the service. But overall, these figures roughly are in gate referrals for gate, 9,409. And we help people get uh, jobs, training, education placements. 1,205 jobs on release from prison, training, education placements, 2,639. In terms of resettlement, uh, again, since 2012, uh, 7,682 people have engaged with that service. Housing applications, 1,570. Medical card applications, 1,772. Um, and social welfare supports, 1,300 thereabouts. Okay, uh, that's the kind of act activity that's very busy in the prison. And we uh, and obviously we need to work with people in the run-up to release. It's not in the week beforehand. It, we try in the last year of a sentence to start working because it's quite a complex process. If we could have the uh, next slide, please. Data capture and data protection. Now this is something in terms of uh, what we uh, what we capture and what we don't. So even in presenting here today. We don't capture information about disability. GDPR, uh, there are GDPR restrictions. We do capture uh, basic data about offence, uh, and we ha have uh, information sharing agreements between ourselves and other agencies. It's quite protected, and we ourselves do not collect data on disability. So it's difficult to look back statistically and report. So anything I'll say today is based on uh, case studies, examples we have, because it is common. And what we heard today is the incidence of disability, mental health, any issues is very broad, very wide, and it's quite common for people to present. And uh, next slide, if I may. Although we don't capture um, information on disability, uh, we do capture something, and I think we're the only ones to do this, we measure distance from the labour market for the gate service. Now, that's an interesting thing. Uh, so of the prison population uh, and of people on probation even, how distant are they from the labour market? And that's something we developed what we call a progression-ready indicator. And that suggests uh, something about the level of need among the people kind of uh, referred to us. Uh, it's, it's a self-reported measure. So basically, it's uh, people present, we work with them, and uh, they present the information we want to capture. There's four classifications uh, in the PRI, uh, and they're quite simple. Job seeking, most able. Those people are trained, able, have the supports necessary to seek a job right now, and they could hold down a job. And that's an interesting thing. And we help them access a job because they're in prison. They obviously don't have it, but they're able to do it. Progression ready. They, all they're missing is some training to facilitate the job seeking. With the training, they have the stability to do the job. Progression potential needs significant support. Of these people, the chances are, if you organize a job for them, they may not be able to show up at the right time and they need support. So there's something, uh, additional support is required before they could take up uh, employment and not progression ready. There are some people who are just not able to engage in that process around employment. Uh, now, this is interesting because uh, if you move on to the next slide, this is what we find mostly of the people we assessed in a prison is the, uh, the least amount is job seeking. So there's very few at any one time when we assess who are absolutely ready to take up a job right now. That's of interest. Uh, the next category down is progression ready. They need training and then could take up the job. There's quite a few of those people and we help them all the time. Progression potential, those who need support, uh, that's the majority. That's uh, the majority of people we assess under the PRI are falling into this category. And you see there's quite a substantial difference in the numbers on the screen. Uh, now, 
with that, uh, they still have an interest in employment and progression. They're engaged. So that's a very important thing. So there's a whole motivation and value around that. You identify what they want. The question is how you support them. So that's the pure right. And what it demonstrates is uh, a deep level of need among the prison population, which is supported uh, by what we've heard uh, earlier on today in the conference. You know, that seems to be well demonstrated. Now, in terms of, um, if we go to the next slide, what we, uh, I call this case studies, but really examples. And what I want to kind of, uh, how do we uh, support people with disabilities in prison? Because even though we don't collect uh, statistical information about people with disability, the information is there at prison review and it's discussed. Uh, we respond to each person individually uh, in terms of their presenting needs and their release date and how we might develop a release plan with them. So the type of issues that are common are obviously mental health, we heard about that earlier on, uh, physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and uh, some people on the ASD spectrum that seems to be coming up more and more um, these days. The type of supports uh, that we would provide are planning and uh, release. So that thing, somebody presents uh, and has a release date and is about to be, the first part of that is planning for release. So no matter what the presenting issue is, there is a plan built around the, their presenting needs, which might include any of the things uh, and access to services. So whatever the service, so each person has a set of needs, we understand them, uh, and we do it with them. We're not doing it for them as much as possible. The person getting out from prison is at the center of the process and uh, getting their buy-in is a central part of, of, of what we do. Um, so we, how we practically support people is developing individualized release plans and ensuring access to essential services. That's the first thing. The second thing is advocacy. Uh, it may be the case that an impairment or a disability might get in the way and often does get in the way of accessing essential services. An example I'll give you is uh, a person with a hearing aid or a hearing impaired person who um, a lot of the services, especially since COVID, are done by phone. And obviously uh, a hearing impaired person cannot access the service through phone. So we're going to be an intermediary in that process and we will make sure that they have access and, uh, and the services in question know what the requirement is so we can best respond. Also, so if we say there's something about the planning, something about access and advocacy is a huge part. We're working on behalf of the people. There's also something about problem solving. Uh, resettlement and release is a complex process. It is, uh, it, it, it does go according to plan sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't, especially, and the people who are getting out. <laughs> Um, I just heard some feedback, sorry. Our complex <laughs> and, um, and things can break down. Uh, so one of the other things we provide is that we respond, if something breaks down, we're there. Every prisoner who gets out has the number of a resettlement coordinator who they can ring and tell that there's a problem. I'll give you an example of a, a prisoner being released from one of our main prisons is thinks he's going back to a B&B organized uh, for him. And of course, there's something wrong with the B&B. Uh, and we're left at the last minute uh, trying to access other uh, accommodation options, which we do. And we're with the person in a practical way uh, providing that support. And that worked out well. Uh, also, that person, uh, and that was no fault of the prisoner, by the way. And uh, we stay engaged with the person. So we, uh, we continue. They also had an interest in training and education. Uh, so their presenting issue was an intellectual disability. They were returning to a particular part of the country. Uh, there was a problem with the accommodation and uh, we are there to help them solve the problem and help them access uh, the B&B and continue the support by helping them access what turned out to be the National Learning Network. Um, in terms also, another way we practically support people with disabilities um, is be, and this was before COVID, but hopefully we'll get back there. Um, but we would drive somebody to an appointment. We would uh, help access services and we would kind of uh, understand the release needs on the day. So there are people who are released with physical disabilities and they may not be able to get from the prison to the train station to wherever they intend to go. So we would look at that. So as much as there is a release plan, there is a set of 
um, there is a specific plan for the day of release and how they are actually going to go about getting to where they're meant to go. And that sometimes is not a, 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 an easy thing. Uh, you can imagine somebody in a wheelchair being released from a prison and trying to access, um, you know, trying to access transport normally. So we would help with that. Uh, and we hope to go back to that after uh, things settle, hopefully after COVID. Um, but also there is kind of a, an interesting uh, thing that these have been, um, there are plenty of, I suppose, uh, we do support people with disabilities. There have been successes, but it's not always straightforward. I have an example of a person presenting with ASD, Asperger's, uh, the higher functioning part of that spectrum, um, and who did not agree with the uh, assessment of their relationship to substance use. Now, we obviously um, organized accommodation. We were able to do that. We organized through Peter McBerry Trust, but that came with supports for uh, drug misuse and the person wouldn't um, take up that accommodation because of that because the, there was a condition on it uh, and since uh, and instead went to the street and since has picked up more offenses and it's drew up in the court again so these are complex assessments and part of it is that we provide what we can uh, but the person is their own entity too uh, and we're not always in control of all the parts um, and hence where uh, the outcomes, uh, we may not be in control of the outcomes either. Um, so ISO really is, we are paid by the, uh, the IPS and the probation service to provide a range of very practical supports that are built around the individual needs of the person. So they change from person to person and, uh, and we, you know, that's uh, how we respond. Um, okay, that's kind of it. Thank you, Fergal, back to you. You're on mute, Virgo. Oh, I am. Sorry, thank you, Barry, uh, for that. Our final speaker on this session is uh, David Williamson, who, as I advised, is a senior probation officer within staff training and development in the probation service. And David is going to speak in relation to uh, recognizing and responding to disability in delivering effective interventions with people subject to probation. So David, if you're there, I don't know if you are. I'm here, Virgil. You are. Go ahead. I am. Uh, and my slides there. are there. Great. So, uh, thanks very much, Virgil. And uh, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon, uh, finishing off, I think, a long day for people, but I hope you'll stick with me. Um, and delighted to see Virgil there. I wanted to name check him because I first came across him when I was a senior probation officer. Uh, covering Mountjoy and Virgil hadn't even joined the prison service and he really became very supportive in enabling me to source long-term community accommodation in a secure unit for a man with significant uh, uh, health and disability issues who was uh, uh, facing a very uncertain future uh, in the community. So uh, I'll give him kudos for that. But I'd like to thank the NDA for the invitation to participate uh, in the conference. Uh, and I actually have learned a lot during the day and I've enjoyed a lot of the uh, uh, sessions that I've uh, listened to and the speakers that I've listened to so far. This is kind of timely for the probation service uh, because I think it's about building on existing positive relationships that we have uh, as an agency particularly with our criminal justice partners. And obviously we have joint strategy statements with the Irish Prison Service, uh, and we have close working relationships uh, with Angarda Corner and the court service uh, as the main statutory uh, agencies, so much so that we have co-located units uh, um, with Irish Prison Service staff in our headquarters uh, and we have a co-located uh, unit with the guards um, uh, within Harcourt Terrace dealing with the supervision of sex offenders in the community. So, but it's looking about building those kinds of relationships with the non-criminal justice agency partners uh, in dealing with the areas of disability that I think is of particular interest. 
Um, I come today both from a training perspective, which is what I do and what I deliver now, but as a practitioner still in practice and as someone who's uh, uh, a fair degree, I suppose, a frontline experience. And before I joined the probation service, I had an 11 year history working in mental health. Uh, and that's a particular interest of mine. Um, um, and I continue to work as a practitioner and carry a small caseload as well. So can I have the next slide, please? In examining the theme of the conference, I think it's worth referencing Article 13. Uh, and I had to then go and do some work on this when I was asked to make this uh, contribution. But the two key elements that we're talking about in Article 13 are of huge interest to us because they're both about the commitments of quality of access to services. Um, and we have a goal of supporting that equality of access uh, through ensuring that staff are appropriately trained. Um, it's interesting to hear about the range of concepts of disability during the day. Um, and we, I suppose, talk a lot about visible and invisible disabilities and are conscious that we face hidden and visible disabilities. Um, and I'll be talking a little more about that uh, later on. But I did note on Katerina's contribution this morning, the importance of framing Article 13 within the whole declaration. Uh, and I certainly took that to heart and we'll be going back and trying to frame this within the other parts of the declaration that she uh, referenced. Next slide, please. But before mentioning what we do a bit like that, I suppose everyone has to say what they are. And I suspect most people are well aware of what the cards do, and most people are well aware of what the prison service does. Um, most people know what the courts do. Very few people know what the probation service does. And my life experience within the probation service is often someone asks you what you do, and when you own up to it, they say, all right, so you work in prisons. And while I have worked a lot in prisons, in fact, the probation service is a community service at its heart, and it's, it, that's its main function. The service is a national function based in community and custody settings, uh, and it's an agency of the Department of Justice and Equality. And I'm not going to go through what the vision and the mission is in great detail, uh, because those are there and can be read. But I suppose if you look at a prison population of under 4,000, I mean, it was up to 4,500 when I was working in it, and I'm always delighted to see it reduced. Uh, but we deal with 15,000 offenders in the community setting across the country. Uh, people who are being diverted from custody, who are being given alternatives to custody, and people who are released from custody. Um, uh, so we, we cover all of those ranges of before, uh, during, and after custody. Um, the, social, the service is a social work agency, and since 2018, uh, to be a probation officer requires that you're registered as a professional social worker with CORU. Uh, and I think that that's important as it informs how we approach looking at disability and informs the training that staff will have gone through before they have ever joined the service. Um, and if I can just reference that as an important thing. Also that the service operates under a huge amount of legislation, about 18 pieces of legislation specifically mention the service and give it very clear responsibilities. Uh, and perhaps one of the things that may not be as well known as would have been is that while probation deals with young people and is often seen as a diversionary uh, uh, piece of work, uh, in fact, under things like the 2001 Sex Offenders Act and under the 2006 Criminal Justice Act, we've been given responsibility for post-release supervision on a legislative basis uh, with the powers to return people to custody uh, and return them back before the courts for failure to comply. And that has meant that we've found ourselves with a greater responsibility for people who may have committed 
uh, more serious offences and have come before the courts uh, facing longer tariff times within the uh, custody setting. So if I can move to the next slide, please. So the service has two functions. It's assessment and supervision, really. And when you think about the article and why we're here, it's very important that it's not just about rehabilitation because the probation service produces reports for the court that assist the court in making decisions as to whether community sanctions are possible and feasible, whether it's suitable for someone to be sanctioned without going into custody, or even if custody is going to be part of a sanction, what may be the prospects for community supervision after sentence or as part of that sentencing process. We also produce victim impact reports and we produce parole board reports. Um, and it was all, it was very interesting to hear in the prisons breakout earlier, the discussions about decisions made where people have disabilities and that may lengthen sentences. And I certainly know in the production of uh, parole board reports, the challenges that there can be in getting community buy-in for someone who is being released from a custody setting and getting services to take on board people who are being released from a custody setting. Uh, so in fact, the determination of someone remaining within a custody setting for longer may not be something that the prison service or that the parole board would like or would prefer, but can often be related to the difficulties of accessing services within a community setting, because very often people are seen as too difficult and are seen as criminal in some way. So our preparation of reports and assessments is one aspect, and then the supervision is the second aspect, and that's probation supervision within the community, community service, uh, working with young people through YPP, the supervision of people who have been convicted uh, and sentenced to life imprisonment, uh, so that we have about 90 people within the community now who have come out on parole or on release uh, uh, under that legislation, and we supervise them for the rest of their lives. And then post-release supervision, as I mentioned in legislation. Can I have the next slide, please? The bulk of research into disability, and I think this has come up loads of times. I don't need to labor it because I've been there during the day and people have talked a lot about this, is that people in the uh, criminal justice system with intellectual disabilities and mental health issues are overrepresented. Um, and that's gone through, people have mentioned that in lots of detail. There's also the fact that people who have these difficulties are marginalized within the system. So there's a double penalty within the system for people who are coming from this kind of background uh, and having these kinds of difficulties. This isn't something that is a shock and I don't think it's something that is new. Um, and certainly uh, when I joined the probation service in the early nineties, my first post was in Mountjoy and my first assignment, having come from 11 years in psychiatry, was to cover what was Sea Wing in those days. And Sea Wing was known in pejorative terms by all the staff within the prison at that time. Uh, it had a, it had a, a, a name uh, which was associated uh, with the fact that many people with mental health difficulties were placed on that wing. Uh, and so it wasn't known necessarily by that. It, was, it had a particular uh, name. And that taught me a lot about how people with disabilities and mental health problems were seen within the prison system. Um, so I, it's, it's been no great surprise to me over the many years that I've been working in the system to, to hear about the level of stats that people are coming up with now. Uh, but I suppose one of the things that's important to mention is that you have to look at these things as opportunity. You have to look at these things where people have capacity and have the ability to make something of that, any disability that is there, that people have potential, that that's where we start from, that's our starting point. And if we don't have that, 
we are in great trouble. Uh, so when we look at those kinds of issues, we have to think about what we're going to do, how we're going to do work with who we work with. And I suppose what I'm concerned to talk about today is not the numbers, is not the things, but how something like the probation service can imagine itself working with people and what we're looking to do. Because if we look at working with people from a probation perspective, we are looking at working at changing a view that many people will have of the commission of crime. That when we work with people, you have to decide whether or not their worldview incorporates the offense and offending behavior as something that is acceptable or normal or that they believe works for them or whether they've come into the system because of a health issue, but with no great underlying criminal attitudes. And how you approach working with people in those different circumstances has to be considered, that they're two very, very different things. Um, they would always say that one of the challenges is working with addiction, for instance, is that simply allowing someone or supporting someone to become sober doesn't always finish the job. And having worked with many of the addiction agencies over time, it's been interesting and instructive to deliver offense focused work alongside addiction, because there are people who have addiction and very long standing addictions where they sit alongside criminal beliefs. And there are people who have addiction who don't actually have particularly strong criminal beliefs. And the journeys those people go on are very different. And that's the very same for people sometimes with mental health difficulties and the very same sometimes for people with cognitive disabilities. That how they see the world in terms of offending and their belief about offending can vary. Uh, and at the moment, I, I'm gonna reference particular cases, a couple of particular cases, to give example to that work. Can I get the next slide, please? So what influences, in our experience, in my experience, contact with the CTS? Well, one of the things, and this references it, is that where there's contact with an ID services or developmental services, that they can often be underrepresented. So where someone with an ID issue or a mental health issue has been very strongly linked and treated by services outside from an earlier age very often, they may be underrepresented. But where there's legally, no legally defined ID or cognitive deficit, but where there's requ re requiring intermittent services, then they can be overrepresented. One might look at the issue of challenging behavior. And when does challenging behavior become criminal? And does all challenging behavior reach out uh, into that area. And I remember working with, with someone who ended up committing the most serious offense uh, and, and remains within, the, uh, within the, the system of the prison service at the moment. And I've worked with them many years ago, but they had had difficulties behaviorally before they had ever seen the inside of a court. And those issues were dealt with uh, on the basis that they were behavioral, even though they were criminal. And it was only when it became something that couldn't be contained within the services externally uh, that it ended up before the courts. And it was still very difficult to work that out. Um, so there's that challenge where there is access to disability services before people go down the criminal justice route. And when you think about it, people in custody settings and people who come into the probation service have greater levels of dis disadvantage, have greater levels of educational deficits. So there are issues about accessing quality disability services if you already start from a position of social disadvantage. So it's a double whammy and that was also referenced. And we have to, um, we have to be taking those things into account when we're dealing with people and in the challenges that we're thinking about. Can I get the next slide, please? So as my kind of case study, 
around this and and as the day has gone on more and more faces have come into my head more and more memories of uh, people with severe and enduring mental uh, health issues with learning difficulties with uh, an inability to read and write uh, with huge levels of trauma within their background have, have been coming up but the thing that I'm currently as most engaged in is working with a 20 year old male in their first court appearance and charged with an assault that was heard in the circuit court because it was of a level which reached the uh, requirement to be in the circuit court and I was preparing a pre-sanctioned report in this case and when I met when I met the the individual and began to work with them I realized the level of negative life experiences they had had in many ways even though they'd grown up in a very positive family a foster family since birth but they faced behavioral and educational challenges they were clearly there they hadn't any history of criminal behavior they were supported by an aftercare service they were attending a training center they had a relationship but they had excessive cannabis use and an extremely complex biological family history and their assault involved their foster parent. Now, that doesn't sound absolutely abnormal, but what I quickly discovered was that I was dealing with someone who had fetal alcohol syndrome. So a hidden disability and not fully diagnosed and no full engagement with services. So clearly diagnosed, I found the history there but no active engagement in services. So all of the difficulties there were in relation to this hidden disability were intermittently being dealt with, not fully addressed. And when you allied the kind of characteristics that sit with that kind of behavior issue, that kind of damage that has been done, alongside managing the trauma of your own complex family history and moving into adulthood, and moving to independence from a foster situation, you're looking at a really difficult uh, situation. Can I get the next slide, please? So as a probation officer, I was finding myself responding to specific issues that I had to learn about. So we were looking at poor memory, poor organization, or poor ability to manage and name emotions, specific additional vulnerability to substance misuse, and challenges in decision making. So when I complete my risk assessment, the assault is very serious. In another circumstance, it might have had a di different outcome. But in this circumstance, the person had no pro-criminal beliefs, no antisocial groupings. They were very compliant. They were very open in their engagement with me. Uh, and we began to use all of the techniques that would be associated with uh, recognizing the disability and trying to respond to the disability, setting an appointment at the same time, at the same week, at the same day, uh, making sure there was a text reminder the day before that it was coming in, making sure the support services knew when they were coming in, sending the appointments for by phone for, uh, for their own uh, counseling appointments for uh, drug misuse, and providing them with material on FAS that was accessible to them and asking them to talk about it and being open about those challenges. So the outcome in this case was a suspended sentence with a period of supervision. But I suppose I talk about the story because as probation officers uh, with a social work background, the importance is seeing the disability, recognizing it and trying to be responsive and seeing where it fits in someone's broader criminal, uh, criminal need. Next slide. And the values and principles that underpin our work, and these uh, come up once on the click, I'm afraid, yeah, are that we have public protection, but that we have a belief in people's capacity to change, that we see ourselves as change agents, that everyone has a right, irrespective of what they've done, to be treated with respect and that interagency working is essential so that we recognize no one agency working alone is as effective as agencies working together. Last slide, I think. 
So just in terms of where we are, the first part of the article, I think we try and address through being responsive and through recognizing the needs there are for people and looking at people individually. In terms of training, we've been holding training sessions with Hebway, with the NRH, with Michael's House, all in the last 12 months. That responsivity in the provision of reports and assessments and supervision is always stressed. Trying to see what the need is, what people understand, and that the staff development unit, the learning unit, has been charged with increasing specific training in relation to disability awareness. So that's all in hand in terms of our training with our staff. What we're trying to do is bring that focus about criminal justice to people who are joining the probation service. They have a, many of the social work training with their, this is about what does that look like in a criminal justice framework. In service provision, I suppose we have a new supervision framework, which we're rolling out, which emphasizes the importance of relationship and about individualizing responses. And it's about building on those existing strong partnerships with uh, criminal justice agencies to, under to ensure that common understanding of disability. I should mention that we do look at estate management in relation to disability and access, uh, and our buildings are being improved all the time, but we have a number of old buildings that have been problematic. So we are looking to improve consultation there, and we like our material to be as accessible uh, as possible. And I suppose the service learns because as a public service, we as a, as a service have people with disabilities in professional administrative grades and have always had that. So you're adjusting to those things in practice as well uh, as anything else. So probation, yes, is dealing with people in a community and a transition phase. We recognize all of those challenges, but for us being sensitive to the needs of the individual and being aware of their disability issues is absolutely central to our heart and our practice. I think Thanks, that's David. the last slide. David, thank you very much for that. I, I know we're, we've run over. I know, so, I know. Uh, I just, I and I know that some people have to leave in the next few minutes. We did get a few questions. I'm just trying to quickly, the first one was given so many agencies and departments are involved in ensuring the inclusion of those with disabilities in the community after a period of imprisonment. Uh, what mechanism will best ensure enhanced cross department across agency working? I suppose if I could just comment on that, first of all, I suppose at prison level, we've done a lot to improve our own cross agency type working with the services, we've built our own platforms for sharing information on uh, pre-release alerts and working with our colleagues in probation, IASIO, uh, National Forensic Service, et cetera. But really importantly is trying to look at what Barry spoke about, those primary care needs. Has the person got income support, accommodation referral, a medical card and release to ensure that the prescription is not interrupted? So uh, externally, where we need the assistance of our colleagues in the HSE, local authorities, uh, you know, it can be more difficult. Uh, so, you know, there are challenges there. I don't know if anybody else on the panel wants to come with a one or two liner, because I want to be other question. I can say, if I could just say very quickly, Virgil, we have a, um, a referral agreement with Intrio at the moment between uh, gate service and the prisons, and it shares PP personal progression plans of prisoners being released to the community and then accessing services from Intrio. The interesting thing about it is it does not duplicate the process. It, it acknowledges that the process starts in the prison and it takes the plans and builds on them into the community. So it's about joining up. So agreements like that would be essential in terms of, I think, because there are indeed many agencies, but we have to recognize that much of this work starts in the prison and it continues out from there. And so rather Absolutely. than- because and I think the, 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 the agreements we have now with social protection, HSC in relation to income support and day of release, so uh, HSC in relation to the award of a medical card on release, mm. and our uh, better engagement with local authorities are all positive. But as, as I think David mentioned and most contributors mentioned, when you get to the really complex places, it becomes more difficult. The second question... As Wait, Fergal, on, Fergal yes? can I just say quickly on that? The existing uh, Health Justice uh, Health Needs Assessment Group and the new task force proposed under the Programme for Government, I think surely holds potential 
to come up with some realistic implementable solutions to uh, our common problems. And it, as I indicated, it might involve a slightly different way of thinking, a slightly different way of all of us doing things, looking at things, and all of us benefiting from, and it doesn't need millions and millions. So I think there's an opportunity in those two groups. Okay. I think we, uh, it just may be us. I think we, it may have been uh, concluded because we ran over. I don't know if anybody's there to correct me. So, look, if that's the case, uh, look, thanks very much, lads. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, look, we'll meet again. We'll meet again. Thanks, Virgo. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. lads. Bye -bye. See you, Virgo. Bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye, bye. Thanks a million, everyone. Thanks for your kind words, David. Thanks. Thanks, Kieran. <laughs>